Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and I'm going to talk about hydrocarbon exploration, recent past, near future. So this is a look back at what's been going on the last decade or so from December 2021. First question people ask is, why are we exploring for oil at all? Now, the world uses about 36 billion barrels of oil a year and around 3,900 billion cubic meters of natural gas. It's quite a lot. And oil consumption has continually grown, uh, although peak demand is forecast by some analysts for the future. Uh, you know, next 10 years, maybe next 20 years, maybe even further out. But even peaking cases, we need new hydrocarbons to replace your producers' current reserves decline. We're running like Mo Farah just to stand still. And we need to develop and explore for hydrocarbons in a responsible way, take into account safety, need to minimize environmental impact, lower carbon. So looking at things like methane emissions, fugitive methane, looking at flaring, making sure we do less of that, do things safe, do things right. This is a slide from Equinor, Norwegian energy company. So why the need for new investments? So this is looking at their uh, supply curves. So this is from legacy fields, potential ranges decline in legacy fields if we do some investment. And these are demand ranges. And what you can see is, although demand may decline, supply declines faster, so we need to keep up with demand. So even in low demand cases, we still need to invest to bridge the gap. And this is an analysis by various people. So um, IEA, EIA, BP and Shell, looking at different demand forecasts. So we have everybody from the um, American EIA that forecasts you know, continued growth to the IEA, the International Energy Agency that has sort of plateau in their you know, state of policy scenario or a decline in a rapid transition case, which mirrors BP's rapid transition case. This is BP's net zero. Uh, this is looking out to 2050. And this is uh, BP's business as usual. And these are two shell cases, Shell Sky, which uh, envisages significant demand further on this century and uh, another shell case. So while OECD demand declines, non-OECD demand increases, and we have to meet that. So have we been fighting enough? In a word, no. Basically, what's been happening is this is 2016's production versus what people have been discovering. So this is a slide from uh, Wood McKenzie data, which is posted up on Bloomberg uh, Bill Moe's blog. And basically, since the 1980s, we've been fighting less than what we've been consuming. So we've been basically living off that been a few occasions where we've uh, gone fairly close to that so that's cash again i was peripherally involved with that as a geophysicist um, there's a few others since then this is some of the brazil santos stuff but even something like that doesn't fully meet that to some extent we've been rescued by unconventionals this is another wood mckenzie graph so the unconventional hydrocarbons in green that's american light tight oil now global reserves have continued to grow when existing resources so basically this pile has been converted into reserves through development but how long can that realistically last there are also some concerns about uh, some reserve reporting in some countries um, middle east opec countries and there was a book by matt simmons called twilight in the desert uh, that has some contrib potentially controversial views but it's worth reading and emp's reserves on investment have not been great uh, we've been in a situation where this again, this is a plot from Old McKenzie's blog, where during the high oil price time, we've actually been destroying value by making dumb investments. Uh, since then, we've uh, in the uh, just before the uh, COVID, we've started to get back into the black, mainly by making smarter investments. But our performance has not been great, and that has been reflected with stock market. So where have the resources have been found? Now, Eddie Ong is a uh, retired geologist who posts quite a bit on social media, so he's given me permission to talk about some of his stuff. And this is his review of post-2007 discoveries. So we've had uh, passive margins in the South Atlantic, both Brazil and West Africa, some work in East Africa, which I was involved with, some work in Egypt, particularly Zor discovery, which is quite an interesting one, some uh, quite a lot of work in Iran, uh, some stuff in Southeast Asia, some stuff in uh, in Russia, a few North Sea things that have been surprised, some Gulf of Mexico, etc. So these is looking at major discoveries. And the big outstanding performers have been Brazil, Brazil Santos Pre-Salt, but also most recently Guyana, where ExxonMobil and their partners have been very successful, plus play extensions in Iran, Norway, such as Ohans Fedrop, which is quite an unusual field, uh, Russia, going out to West Siberia, and Mexico onshore plus also the unconventionals and light title in America. 
some new gas processes in East Africa, Mozambique and Tanzania, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, so that's Egypt, Israel and Cyprus, plus also most recent discoveries in Turkey and the Black Sea. So there is stuff to be found and we are finding stuff, although maybe not quite enough. A little bit about um, the oil discoveries. Most recent discoveries have been large placid margins and most of them have been in deep water. So that's where exploration has tended to be concentrating success. Well, there have been useful shallow water things, like Johann Sverdrup. There have been some interesting things on land, some, some of the Mexican stuff, some of this stuff in West Siberia and Iran, but mostly deep water, mostly passive margin. And a little bit about where the big discoveries were. Again, uh, Santos Basin in Brazil, conjugate margin in East Africa, in West Africa, East Africa, East Ahmed, plus a few others that have been around that uh, that have done that and most of them have been in the cretaceous and tertiary so a little bit about play types in terms of uh, structural types mostly there have been combination straps and stratigraphic traps some fault related very few four-way dip closures generally what tended to happen is the simple structures tend to have been drilled first we're now in the realm of the complex structures because we're getting further ahead so who's been the top discoverers now uh this is a graph again eddie put together from various sources and uh you're looking at nocs so petrobras nioc and iran pemex plus some majors have been very effective e and i has been a top explorer been a very active in east africa plus there's all discovery in the in the eastern mediterranean egypt equinor have been quite successful s of exxon mobile most recently Guyana, although they've had although that's very recent and total has been continually going so various independents like tolo have been uh, have had quite a bit of success but some successful explorers uh, have gone by the wayside they've been taken over so anadarko cobalt noble and my former employers bg so a little bit about what's going on in the near future so this is a graph from ihs energy looking at some high impact wells that are coming within um, the, the last year or so and the next uh, coming up year in uh, in africa again focus for a lot of exploration in the past uh, discovering quality war by in and i Again, some materials around Kaboy. And quite an interesting well, uh, Venus in uh, Namibia. Um, it was presented at uh, the latest, at the last PETEX conference, uh, which is uh, very interesting um, in terms of what could, could happen. Could be a, a very interesting well indeed. And Total also gave a presentation at the latest PETEX conference, looking at their South African success, which was done a few years back, uh, sort of here at the bottom of the end of uh, Cape Agulhas, and looking at other. Uh, uh, potential fields that are going to be involved in Africa. So they farmed into Venus, for example. Uh, Total are very bullish on Africa, and for them, it's a very much a future uh, growth area uh, where they're going to be spending roughly half of their exploration budget. There was also a very interesting talk in PETEX by um, Graham Bagley of uh, Westwood Energy, a top analytics firm. And it's a little bit of a summary of what he said. You know, he looked at uh, high impact wells, which uh, he defined as 100 million barrels of oil equivalent or a frontier or a play opener. And they're averaging about 70 of wells like that a year since the 2015 crash. There were a lot more before then, but they were less successful. And next couple of years, they're looking at something fairly similar, 60 to 70 wells. And these high impact wells, uh, Westwood estimate, discovered about 39 billion barrels of resources uh, within the last uh, five years. So that's a little bit more than one year's consumption to give you a, 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 a setting. So in the last uh, year or so, there have been some large discoveries in Russia, uh, plus also Guyana, plus also a few in Senegal, plus some others. Uh, the frontier wells have declined since 2016. Basically, they're now only about 20% of high impact wells, and they have a low success rate. Only about 7% of them actually make commercial hydrocarbons. Whereas overall success rate, commercial success rate is about 20 technical success rates in the mid 30s. Uh, so there's quite a lot now of focus on emerging proven hotspots. So we're something we've had an initial discovery, we build on that, we grow the hotspot because that's where you can make real value. And only two real big super basins have been found, which is Santos and Brazil and Guyana, that have over 5 billion barrel potential. There have been some others that have been in the billion barrel plus 1.5 billion uh, in the last 15 years, but these are the two that made a real big difference. Uh, again, most high impact is in deep water. Africa was very significant in the first half of the decade, but was hit higher just by a crash. Again, deep water, higher costs, longer payback times. And uh, our exploration activity fell by nearly half since the oil price crash. And this correlates with what, what I did in various analyses. 
So for Total, for example, are now planning to drill 20, 25 wells a year, whereas previously they used to drill 50 wells a year. And quite a lot of focus on infrastructure-led exploration, which worked well in the heartlands. Areas which you know, areas which you understand, high success rates, extra value, short payback time. And who's exploring? Traditionally, it's been the super majors international NOCs. So international NOCs have been people like Petrobras, uh, people like uh, Petronas of uh, Malaysia. And there's, but there's been a squeeze middle. Uh, Medium-sized companies have either got out of uh, exploration, been taken over, or in case of North American companies, concentrated on light tight oil. Some rationalization by countries. For instance, BP will not be entering any new countries. Uh, Shell will, uh, will do so. We'll also have this policy coming into the future. And looking for advantage, lower impact hydrocarbons. And looking at $40 a barrel break even because that was shaking us. A little bit on exploration bans and restrictions. Generally, it's been tended to be countries that don't have much of a hydrocarbon industry anyway, that are basically uh, making easy green points. So countries like France, Spain, uh, Portugal, New Zealand, although they do have a bit of production, uh, and Ireland, where there's been quite a big issue, uh, although they do have one active gas field. Uh, Denmark's the one more significant country which has done that because they still produce some hydrocarbons. They produce about... Uh, 100,000 barrels of oil per day, if my memory serves me correctly. But what they're actually doing is they're banning new exploration, but they're letting the old fields produce till their end of life, which is going to be in about 15, 20 years anyway. So that doesn't really change very much, and they don't have much exploration potential. One Danish territory, which is self-governing, which is Greenland, has made a decision not to have any future exploration. Now, they've had quite a bit of exploration in the past, but no much success. Also in um, in the UK, another North Sea country, there was a big fuss about Cambo, which uh, Shell had pulled out of, and the government is delaying uh, approval of this field west of Shetland. But Norway, they've had an election, they're committed to responsible exploration. All the main Norwegian political parties were in favour of that. So a bigger issue, particularly for smaller companies, is the issue of financial institutions, which are pledged to stop hydrocarbon funding and lending. There's a big fuss about uh, lending to an LNG project in Mozambique. Now, that's going to lift that country out of poverty, but heck, we've got a bunch of uh, green things that we don't really care about a bunch of African people wanting to get rich. But, there's, but, uh, but there could be funding from Asian banks, there could be funding from within Africa, uh, basically outside the Western financial system. So looking at the future, there's a split within the mangers between uh, USA and Europe, whether BP and Shell will be less exploration focused, they may be focusing on an industry transition, more BP than Shell, but uh, they'll be uh, doing that. Equinor, Total, Ni and I, meanwhile, will still do exploration, but they'll also be doing alternative energy. And Total are fairly big on that. They did a presentation. We're going to do both. We're going to explore responsibly, and we're going to do alternatives. Whereas Exxon and Chevron, uh, they'll do a little bit of that, uh, but they're mainly focused also on their light tight oil projects in the USA. So that's their competitor. In terms of independence, small companies, they are a favor with the stock market, but they quite often have the brightest ideas, some which actually work. So what will happen there? Also, will North American dependents return to conventional aspiration or will they concentrate on returning money to shareholders? What will NOCs do, both home and away? Very active and are self-funded and less concerned about things. What will the Russians do? Russian companies, Luke Oil has now been looking overseas. What about the others? And Asian companies, big boom 15, 20 years ago, will they be back? So just to summarize, we're finding less oil and gas than before, uh, than we're consuming. And all by the, mo by the norm of the most pessimistic cases, we're going to need some new oil. Had some new uh, provinces in the last decade or so, Santos, Guyana, Eastern Med, East Africa, but also a fair amount of disappointment. Most things that just didn't work at all, things that were only worked marginally. Majors are scaling back exploration, and then independents need finance, particularly the Western independents. So challenging political environment in the West, less so elsewhere. But focus on super basins, infrastructure-led exploration, creating value in the heartlands. Will the NOCs fill the gap? What will the Russian companies do? Will the North American dependents go back to financial, uh, conventional exploration instead of focusing on LTO? What about private companies from Asia, Latin America, and even possibly Africa? And technologies, techniques advance, lowering risk, increasing understanding. Our boffins are getting smarter. Hopefully, they'll be given a chance. So thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.